I'd like to uh, talk to you today about tempo. The piano seems to be the only instrument that allows to stretch beyond expectation this slow movement of the appassionata opening of Beethoven's because of the length of sound that it has, incomparably longer than for the pianos of Beethoven's time. And this reflection comes to me by the fact that it's unnaturally slow, but it's possible, and with conviction and length of sound, you can build a totally different soundscape. Naturally, and that's the reason I was thinking about it, when you play chamber music, as a pianist with non-pianists, obviously like string players, winds, wind players or singers, they are limited, if not directed towards the tempo, by their instrument's limit. The length of the bow, the speed of the bow, the breath, of course the articulation in terms of the enunciation of the words in the singing, which are the meaning of the verb before the songs, the notes, and therefore the meaning cannot be interrupted by a breath in the middle of a sentence, uh, or a stanza, and so forth. So, that are not considered limitations by them, but for pianists it seems like the physical, physiological necessity for breathing isn't the same, because it doesn't exist. It's only an intellectual concept. And so we can um, play solo piano to our delight and inspiration. Even if you're a magic musician in your head, you cannot play a fugue solo on the oboe. And uh, you cannot play such a tempo in a slow movement as I just did with a violin. In other words, those are impossibilities. But then what becomes very interesting is, take an example of Brahms sonata with violin, like the second one, slow movement. <laughs> with uh, one of my dearest musician friends, Patrice Fontana Rosa, violinist. He was very, 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 very compelling telling me at the recording session that it's a simple song. And therefore the andante walking, moving, any time we use any of the Italian terminology, we can make it say whatever we want it to be. Richter used to tell me, smell every second rose in the garden, whatever that means, except that it's a way to, 
always paraphrase with a beautiful image something that you cannot really define other than a beat per minute on the metronome and which by itself doesn't give any answer because it's not because you subdivide the parsley that it tastes better I mean obviously at some point you play it as you feel it and the audience says thank God don't listen to bar lines and they don't want to know if you count in subdivide it or if you organize the bars by eight or whatever it's your structural architectural view they only hear the sentence of the storytelling and um, I still think that very often we reach that point where when he tells me this simple melody I was thinking yes what if Brahms had then in piano part wise had written a simple accompaniment like a because perhaps Brahms wouldn't have used an Alberti bass but even if it's in the piano part it's like a dark cloud on the sunshine of the via truly as Patrice says for the violin part a very naturally flowing simple in that center sense non-chromatic not affected by affect line obviously and so we can always discuss of what is simple compared to what is not or what is flowing compared to what is uh, not and um, what an andante means to a musician because of an instrument or because of a culture Germany, Russia share the slow tempi precision oh my god they always find everything too fast but it's not a question of speed it's a question of um, um, how you you, you, you feel about the ecosystem in which you are. Obviously, if a movement is very calm, and if by any mistake or non-control of a touch or a piano that is defective, you make an unexpected accent, it kills that sense of lake mirror surface. But then that means it could be also faster. sensation of tempo is not the speed like when you're in a train and another train is leaving you think it's yours moving at some point your perception of movement is not the same it depends on the articulation phrasing and of course instrument and uh, obviously most of the composers who wrote chamber music with piano to take Brahms, Beethoven, Schumann, Fauré, uh, Franck are all Symphonist, organist, not to mention Beethoven and Mozart who played viola too, but generally speaking keyboardists, symphonists, um, let's say organists in the polyphonic sense of the word, um, but it is true that they hear polyphonically and then when they write the parts for the trio's violin cello part they're mostly arias and the piano plays mostly the orchestra structures, would it be differently layered but nevertheless more complex so it's up to the pianist to be able to play in sort of clarity all this complexity not to overweight the melodic line or the um, part of the other instruments but again to come back to the opening if you play the Beethoven's of um, Arpeggione by Schubert 
It starts with the piano. And by the time you have the cello, viola, arpeggio, and la, si, do, la, si, do, re, mi. The tempo is the traction of the length of the bow, the speed of the bow. You cannot, even if you like it, you cannot start in the. When it's overstretched, it sounds artificially unnatural for the phrasing. On the other end of the spectrum, when it's artificially fast, it's usually for a, especially pianists for a question of um, probably um, impressing by the fingers, like a Mozart sonata for violin in A major. <laughs> fast, you can subphrase, you can start embellishing it and perhaps lose some kind, of, some kind of simplicity of it. You could also play slower but straight. Which I think you shouldn't, but it's possible. So in other words, the speed is a perception like... Mesmerizing feeling, yeah. <laughs> but when you play solo the piano, you choose your tempi according to also your perception of the length of sound, but mostly the phrasing where you breathe. If you do the F minor uh, Bach in, um, in um, invention in three parts. because it's really voice leading practice with beautiful chromaticisms and lament, sorrow, feeling. Of course you can take it faster. And usually it's more easy to flow until the arrival point of each phrase. So the punctuation, the phraseology, everything just is understood gently. I played within weeks, I was 10, the first concerto by Beethoven, and Yehudi Menuhin conducting a Paris orchestra conducted it in two. Two for the tutti. Notes. Towards the end of the exposition. 
position. Later, I was to play it in Berlin in the Philharmonic Hall, you know, very impressive, but exciting too, naturally. And I wasn't, while a child, obviously unaware of most experiences of musicians, since I had none, and I naively thought that the world of music had defined the tempi and that everybody in the world conducts the same tempo. And Herr Thomas Meyer in Berlin conducted the opening for my astonishment and almost actually fear like this. Two, three. Aesthetically I could say, oh my god, this is twice slower but it's so elegant and so posed. But then of course I was a child and I didn't have a technique and so it's easier to conceal the lack of technique when you play fast and put some pedal it becomes to take another image is like low tide and you see everything that the sea left before it retracted and before it comes back in other words the the, the defects of the technique were more obvious in the slow tempo. But that said, uh, I understood that very day, as a child, that there is no truth. It's worse than not believing in Santa when you discover he doesn't exist. Or rather that there are ways of hearing the music differently with the same conviction under the coating of tradition. Later I recorded the five cello sonatas with Dominique de Villancourt by Beethoven and we worked ten years on them in almost every aspect of the interpretational um, spectrum until we find what corresponds to us. In Paris, when I studied in the conservatory, Beethoven's tempi are usually more driven and after this experience when I was a child I was telling him we can do third sonata scared so Italianate or Prussian to do with the downbeat theme, upbeat theme, the style, like in the Beethoven's finale of the concerto. Sorry for these wrong notes, but this is the example. And the opening. Beethoven playfully plays on the piano in the introduction without accents on the downbeat, so it becomes a sort of a false upbeat, downbeat starting. Which is in fact tam 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 when the orchestra enters. So it's playful, it's like Haydn-esque humor in music. And then when it goes in tempo fast, the next section. Because that becomes. And. <laughs> so you think. Okay, when I studied with Richter, I asked him how he chose the tempi he took with the well-tempered clavier recording on LP, which I used to have from the, I guess, Soviet days of his uh, back then, which were his anyway, on Melodia recordings. And uh, he said to me, disappointingly to me, because I was hoping to hear the formula of the right tempo, if there was one, as a student, as a child at the time mostly, well, both. He said, ah, next day I would have recorded it differently. Not that the pianists therefore have no integrity, because they can play any tempo they want, since the instrument allows it, and if they're convinced, perhaps they should, and Gould has explored some extremes compared to others. 
as a teacher you want to make sure the student knows the right one that will let them pass the exam, the audition, the jury. So you don't want to play into making them into, um, let's say, appearing to audiences or juries eccentric. But sometimes the quality of the touch, the articulation, the length of sound, the way you organize your phrase without a diminuendo intuitively. If you diminish on the G, you break the line into two sub, uh, sub phrases. And if you play fast, perhaps less gravitas. We don't have conductors for solo pianists and a hint is an exaggeration. So we have an inner ear that imagines the piece like a blueprint of an architect visualizing in 3D the edifice that doesn't exist and we go towards it when we start playing. And we build some kind of sound castle of daydream. And the audience might just enjoy it for what it is even if it might be not the right one, according to this or that tradition, this or that tempo marking, this or that edition of publications and YouTube University comparative recordings today available and perhaps convictionless for some, but I think with conviction you can, on the piano, play tempi that correspond to some wild imagination. I think is necessary a freedom to harness, but not to um, censor. Honesty is most beautiful in interpretation. Thank you. <laughs>